Huber for the invitation, but I think you have the talks mixed up because the de-stress talk <laughs> would have been a lot better than mine right now. Some of my students are here, some of my former students, I'm very glad to see all of you here, some of my colleagues from St. Francis. And right now, those students who are sitting in the room are getting ready for final exams, so I think the de-stressing thing would have worked a little bit better than this. But um, I'm glad uh, for the opportunity to come and talk to everyone here. I appreciate the invitation. The Allen County Public Library and working with you, uh, Mark, has uh, helped things go very smoothly. So the premise of this entire speaker series, and Dr. Ritchie is here, the initiator of the entire thing last year, uh, was to bring uh, University of St. Francis faculty to talk about topics uh, of either personal or academic interests that might be uh, in some way interesting to the rest of uh, a public audience. And so in participating in that this year, I decided to talk about something that has interested me for a long time. Um, as Mark mentioned, uh, a lot of my research and my teaching has dealt with, um, come on in. I don't know if we have any more chairs or not, okay. Um, has dealt with uh, the general topic of modern German history, specifically Nazi Germany, and I teach courses at the university on a wide range of uh, modern European and uh, uh, world history topics. One of them is the history of modern Germany, uh, and then courses on uh, comparative genocide and um, the Holocaust and other topics. And in my years of research and teaching, one of the questions that has always interested me in studying totalitarian societies in general, uh, but specifically uh, Nazi Germany, it's the question of those uh, who chose not to go along with uh, what were otherwise very popular uh, regimes, or at least for a time, very popular regimes and what that means. And one of the interesting questions um, in studying specifically the German resistance, and I'll get to this in a second, is, um, and another historian has posed this question in a different setting, is who cares? They failed. In other words, they failed to achieve their first and biggest goal, which was to remove Adolf Hitler from power. Uh, and so one of the questions that historians and other uh, politicians, not only in Germany but elsewhere, have brought up is uh, the bigger question, which is why study the resistance? What does studying um, acts of resistance, even if they fail to accomplish what they intend to do, what does that uh, profit us? How beneficial is that? And I want to look at some of those questions tonight, specifically in the context of um, Nazi Germany. The image that you see up here um, is a plaque at what is called in English the Memorial Center for the German Resistance. In German, it's the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand. And that is uh, in kind of a centrally located position in Berlin. If any of you have ever been there uh, to the city of Berlin, it's uh, kind of in the center of the city, around the corner uh, from where the Berlin Philharmonic is. It's only maybe about a mile and a half or two miles from there. Um, the plaque, translated from German, uh, is up here to the right, and it says, You did not bear the shame. You resisted. You imparted the eternally vigilant symbol of change by sacrificing your impassioned lives for freedom, justice, and honor. Okay? There are also other plaques uh, at the center. This memorial center for the German resistance during the Second World War uh, had been uh, the headquarters uh, for a number of different agencies, uh, and it also happened to be the location where probably the most famous plot against Hitler, the July 1944 bomb plot that was carried out by Klaus von Stauffenberg and several others. Um, it, it's the place where they were arrested and in the courtyard of this building where they were uh, uh, summarily not even tried and then executed. Okay? It is now an excellent uh, museum that is devoted to all sorts of aspects of the resistance uh, movement to Nazi Germany. Uh, 
And if you are ever in Berlin, uh, I'd recommend going if you have a chance to do so, okay? But this quote raises an interesting question. Today for us sitting in this room, uh, I would hope that we would universally acknowledge the fact that resisting Hitler and the Nazis was unequivocally a good thing to do. I think, I would hope everyone would agree with that idea, okay? And there is a clarity to that idea today that did not exist at the time. So this quote that you see here uh, unequivocally praises those who resisted. All right? They gave their lives for freedom, justice, and honor. And it gives a very kind of clear picture, good uh, versus evil. All right? What we find when we study the resistance at the time is that picture was not nearly as clear as it is today. And so one of the other things that has always interested me about resistance, especially in Nazi Germany, is how was uh, resistance dealt with? both at the time during Nazi Germany and then afterward. One of the interesting things that I'll talk about later in this lecture and that you'll find is that by no means did the German public regard those who attempted to kill Hitler after the war as uh, being only good. There's a very interesting story about how the resistance is seen after the war. And so this question has come up over and over again in my research and in my lectures and in my classes and so um, I thought tonight it would be an interesting topic to discuss. So let's look at some of the problems and interpretations first of the idea of resistance. One of the common misperceptions is the use of a article, a particular word, and that is the German resistance. The idea that, and that implies that the resistance uh, was a uniform process. And in fact, what we know, and what I indicate up here, is that in fact there were multiple groups, often with very different goals. Often there were individuals who sought to achieve only one particular outcome um, that differed maybe from other groups. In other words, the resistance should be seen as the history of a number of individuals and groups. Sometimes those individuals and groups did not all agree um, in their desire to do something about the Nazi state. What they wanted to do was not always clear. Okay? Um, it's also important because that resistance was tied to key periods or events in the history of Nazi Germany. One example of this, and I'll talk about this later, when things were going well for Hitler and the Nazi leadership, especially when uh, Nazi Germany enjoyed amazing military successes early in the war against Poland, a very rapid campaign against Poland in 1939, and then in the spring and early summer of 1940, the conquest of Belgium and the Netherlands and then eventually France, Hitler's popularity was at an all-time high. What we find is that carrying out acts of resistance against the regime when that regime and the person of Hitler is very popular is very difficult to do. Uh, many of the, the real movement toward resistance you see comes in times of crisis, um, and we'll talk about uh, how that works as well. So the resistance is really a whole series of different groups, and it also depends on the timing. In other words, what period you're looking at um, when you think about what the resistance was, okay? Question number two up here um, on this board is also uh, uh, interesting as well. And there are some questions that I've put up there, and these are, are some of the interesting questions, I think, generally that we can talk about, okay? Uh, the first is, how do we define the concept of resistance, okay? Is resistance to the Nazi regime only made up of those individuals who actively cooperated with one another and sought to use violent force to overthrow the regime? Is that the only form of resistance that we're talking about? For some, the answer to that is yes, but I think uh, we would be missing a lot if that's our only answer, okay? A second question, B, up here. <clears throat> 
what does it actually mean to resist in a totalitarian society? In other words, in an unfree society, in a society in which um, an authoritarian state attempts to control all parts of your behavior, both your public and your private life, what does it mean to resist that? Okay? For example, when the Nazi regime attempted to shut down and eventually legally did successfully shut down all non-Nazi youth organizations in Germany, including organizations affiliated with the churches, um, what did it mean uh, to join an illegal youth organization? Or what did it mean for parents to refuse to send their son or daughter to join the two approved Nazi organizations, the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls? Well, you would say, well, those people aren't trying to overthrow the regime. That's right. But they are also taking issue with measures that the regime has taken. So where does that fit? Okay. A third question, point C here on the outline. Do outcomes matter? And this is the big question that I posed at the beginning of this. Does it matter if the resistance succeeded? In other words, if they didn't, should we study it? Do we only study winners? Do we only study those who actually succeed? Um, and I think uh, I'll answer that later on. I think the answer to that is no. It's important to understand it in and of itself. Okay? And then um, a couple other points. The entire question of the resistance to leadership during a time of war and the question of treason. What does it mean, for example, for a German general or someone involved in the German intelligence services actively to give away intelligence information to countries that you are engaged in war with and potentially endanger the lives of German soldiers in the field? Where is your higher calling? Is your loyalty to the state that you serve, regardless of its behavior, even to the point of backing whatever decisions the leader, Adolf Hitler, makes? Or do you have an obligation to try to remove that leader and in so doing risk the lives of soldiers who are fighting for that same country in the field? Okay? Or is that treason? This is another very interesting question, okay? and I'll talk about that in a minute. A couple other um, last points. One of them that I personally find interesting is how is resistance interpreted after it's over with? In other words, how did the German people themselves understand what resistance meant after 1945, after the war was finished, after Nazism has, had been defeated? Um, and so I'll look at that briefly at the end of my talk. And then uh, the last point here, I would argue, is it's important to understand the nature of uh, the society in which resistance takes place and the political system in which resistance can occur. So to do that, the next point that I want to take on in my talk tonight is to look very, very briefly at some of the key features of Nazi Germany to help us understand where and how possibly resistance could take place. Okay? So those are some of the questions I'll get at tonight and I want to turn briefly to the structure of Nazi society, okay? Okay, a couple things about German politics in the so-called inner war period. In other words, the period between the end of the First World War and the year 1933, which is the year that Adolf Hitler comes to power. The government that ran Germany between the end of World War I and uh, 1933 was called the Weimar Republic. Uh, and this had to do with a town in Germany, a pretty small town in which uh, much of the constitution for this government was drafted. Uh, it was uh, a presidential uh, constitutional republic. Now, without going into a great deal of detail here, it matters uh, for a number of different reasons. But most importantly, it matters because it was a multi-party system uh, rather than the sort of dominant system that we have uh, in the United States where, you, where we're used to two parties dominating our, our political landscape, not to say that there aren't more or couldn't be more, uh, 
Um, the German system leading up to the Nazi period was made up of a whole range of different parties. Seven or eight major political parties that garnered votes from um, the German populace. And so one of the myths about Hitler and Nazi Germany, and you'll hear this over and over again, and you'll hear it repeated. Many of my students are familiar with this because I've made this point before. Is that Hitler was not elected into his office. Okay? Now you would think, well, this is a minor detail. Well, it matters a lot, actually. Hitler was appointed as the actual office that he was appointed to was Reich Chancellor. In other words, he was the head of the political structure of Germany. There was also a president in Germany at the time, uh, and he was the one who was formally responsible for appointing Hitler to his position. Why does all this matter? If you look at point A up here, let's look at the vote totals for the Nazi party. The Nazi party burst onto the electoral scene in the September 1930 elections. They had been a marginal party before that. Why September 1930? Because of the impact of the worldwide depression, uh, which was hitting the United States very hard, other major industrialized countries. And the Nazi vote total in response to the dire economic situation of the Great Depression skyrockets. The Nazis go through the ceiling. In the July 1932 election, they reached their highest electoral total of 38% of the total vote cast. They became the single biggest party in the 1930, uh, 1932 elections. Elections were held again in November of 1932, and their number dropped about 5% down to 33. Okay? So while they were the biggest party, and they were widely popular throughout Germany, they were not the exclusive choice of the German electorate. In other words, if you look at it differently, roughly 60% of Germans voted for other political parties. Um, for example, the German Communist Party at the time drew a large number of votes. The German Social Democrats, the SPD, uh, drew a number of, of votes. And so when Hitler was appointed by President Paul von Hindenburg in January of 1933, um, there were limits on what the Nazis could actually do in German society initially. Okay. Hitler, as terrible as he was, as uh, compelling a public speaker as he was in many ways, Hitler was not a magician. Hitler could not overnight force people who did not support him and not believe in his ideas overnight simply to start believing in them. Right? So the point here is that in a pluralistic society, a society of many different parties, of many different opinions, um, the Nazis initially, when they come to power, are limited. They are restrained in what they can actually accomplish. And it's important to understand this because sometimes we think Hitler comes to power and immediately has total power and can do whatever he wants to anyone in, the, in German society. And it's important to understand um, that that is not the case. Okay? Well, as I say, point two up here, why does all that matter? Um, and we could spend a lot more time on interwar electoral politics, but um, I don't want you to fall asleep. Uh, so why does all this matter? So point A, when the Nazis actually take control in Germany in 1933, um, they are facing parts of German society that are either mistrustful or opposed to their control of government and society. Okay? In other words, there are parts of society that reject what they're attempting to do. All right? Point B, Hitler was certainly politically savvy, um, but he possessed no magic wand, again, as I said before, that could immediately convert all Germans into loyal, true believers in the Nazi cause. All right? And as a result of that, in the first years of Hitler's regime, the Nazis had to proceed with relative caution certainly by comparison with their actions later on, um, they were quite cautious in many of their early policies. They had to rely heavily on propaganda 
trying to project an image of the party and of Hitler that they believe fit their vision of a new German society, and violence, using the state and its institutions to suppress, torture, and kill those opponents that sought to push back against what they wanted to accomplish. So propaganda and violence became tremendously important in the early years. What else? The Nazis uh, moved to do several basic things. The first thing, A, they want to suspend basic civil rights and use violence to isolate or liquidate political opponents. You see, after 1933, a rapid expansion of the concentration camp system, for example. Yes? What I don't understand is, before Hitler was appointed chancellor, mm -hmm. Was the chancellor usually voted by the popular vote? No. So it was always an appointment? Correct. So he was not responsible to the people then? Well, indirectly, yes, because what we're talking about is a parliamentary coalition, in a sense. So a, a very brief way of explaining this would be to say, um, if you have enough, let's say you have three major parties who gain a very large vote total in a particular election. And those three parties agree to form a government, to come together and, and run the nation's government at that point. Those three political parties would also agree on the person that would serve as chancellor. Uh, the British equivalent would be a prime minister. Okay? That's the equivalent in this, in this position. And so in that sense, the formal process is then the president uh, of the Weimar Republic would then call that individual to serve in that office. But when you went into the voting booth in Germany, you are not voting for an individual to be chancellor. You are voting for individuals of political parties, and those political parties that gain the largest number of votes would then decide on who the chancellor would be. Does that? And what was the, what was the purpose of the presidency? That's a very interesting question. And again, some of my students who are here will answer that, uh, or could. So when Germany was defeated in the First World War, Germany up to uh, the very end, until the last months of the war, Germany was ruled by um, an emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was the last emperor uh, of Germany. And his family, uh, the Hohenzollerns, had ruled uh, first the German state of Prussia and then Germany for hundreds of years. And so he was forced out. He was kicked off the throne. One of the conditions for Germany to surrender at the end of World War I was that they get rid of the monarchy. Okay? Most constitutional scholars of the Weimar Republic argue that the, the founding fathers of the German Weimar Constitution built a strong executive or a strong presidency into the Constitution to replace the position of the old emperor as a counterbalance to popular government which they believed would run amok, in other words. The answer to your question, you ask a very good question there, um, the answer is it was actually, it, it, the system did not work well. And there's, a, there's an even worse way that it worked because the president was endowed with, uh, with one of the articles of the German Constitution was Article 48 that gave emergency powers to the president. But that takes us a lot farther afield than we need to go. But that's, I hope that answers your question. Okay. All right. So, in this restricted early period, what do the Nazis have to do? They suspend basic civil rights and use violence to intimidate their political opponents. Vast expansion of the concentration camp system occurs from 1933 forward. Okay? You replace the freedom of the press with a centralized office of propaganda. You cannot allow a pluralistic exchange of ideas. You have to concentrate and control how information is communicated to the public, okay, to, sh to sort of craft what that image will look like, all right? Three, you get rid of the multi-party system that you and I just discussed. You literally outlaw, you ban all other political parties, severely restrict political freedoms, and you basically remove a political way of doing further damage or undermining the regime's authority. The last thing that you do is you create a well-trained secret police force. Um, in German, uh, most of you or many of you have probably heard reference to the Gestapo, 
Gestapo is actually a, uh, a shortened uh, uh, sort of an acronym of a number of other words. In German, it's the Geheimes Staatspolizei, which refers to the secret state police. And in effect, what you are doing is creating a secret police force that can arrest and detain people, not just for what they're doing, but for what they think and how they behave and what they write. Okay? So this is an attempt to control as much as possible what the population thinks, um, how it views the regime, uh, and uh, then accordingly what its actions will be from that. Okay? The Nazis also repeatedly use a phrase which is very useful and an insightful way of understanding what the Nazis sought to establish. Uh, the German language, for those of you that know it, is uh, famous for combining words together and creating large, larger words. And this is one of those. So this word in German is the Volksgemeinschaft. Okay? Um, when we translate that into English, it, it doesn't have exactly the same translation, but it comes across as the people's community. Okay? That sounds pretty innocuous, right? People's community. Well, it doesn't sound all that bad. Well, what did it mean? The Nazis used this all the time as a classic insider-outsider dynamic. The Volksgemeinschaft meant all of those Germans who were racially, um, based on their background, based on their beliefs, based on their attitudes, who were part of the insider cult of the Nazi state. If you were part of the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, you mattered, uh, you could get jobs, your kids could go to school, you could exist and have a, a, a fairly normal life. If you were outside of that community, um, your life could very quickly uh, become hellish in many, many different ways. And there were many different groups of people who ended up outside of that community. And so the goal there, as I put in point C, is to create a closely knit, deeply loyal society that can be monitored and controlled at all times. That is at least the goal. Okay? So now you think, how on earth do you resist in something like that? They're trying to control what you read, how you behave, what you think, what you do. In many cases, literally what you're allowed, how you worship, all sorts of different things. How do you resist in that sort of society? And then you take a look at one of the most important, one of the key pieces of uh, Nazi society, which is the role of the German military. Without question, the German military in German society before 1945 consistently was regarded um, by the German people as one of the most trustworthy um, and sort of uh, honorable institutions in society. And it also happened to be one of the parts of German society that Hitler most feared or was most concerned about. In attempting to implement many of his policies, Hitler was constantly concerned in the early years with how the German military and especially German military leaders would react to his proposals. And so, one of the things that Hitler did, and there's a long backstory to this as well, in August of 1934, the president that you asked me about, Paul von Hindenburg, he was a war hero from the First World War, he was a famous German general in World War I, he dies. Uh, the president, the sitting president dies. So, of course, immediately Hitler wants to hold elections for uh, another president and create an independent office, right? I'm not making light of it, but of course not at all. Hitler's immediate move upon Hindenburg's death is to remove the office of the presidency altogether and combine his office with the office of the presidency into a new political position of leader. And the German word for that is Führer. Okay? When Hindenburg dies, Hitler sees an opportunity to strengthen the tie between the institution of the German military and his own person. And you can see this very clearly in these two quotes. 
When you were sworn in, if you were taken into the German military before August of 1934, in this, the Weimar Republic, the interwar period, this is what you would swear when you were being taken in. I swear loyalty to the Reich, the German term Reich, uh, the nation, okay? I swear loyalty to the, na the nation's constitution and pledge that I, as a courageous soldier, always want to protect the German Reich, the nation, and its legal institutions, and I will be obedient to the Reich president and to my superiors. That's, that was your oath, okay? And that was taken as absolutely, as, as seriously as it could possibly uh, be taken on your life. As soon as the president dies and Hitler combines the office of president with Reich Chancellor, the oath is changed. Note the language change. Now you swear not to the Constitution or to the nation or the state, but instead, I swear to God this sacred oath that to the leader of the German Empire and people, Adolf Hitler, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, I shall render unconditional obedience and that as a brave soldier I shall at all times be prepared to give my life for this oath. So if you notice the shift here, it is from swearing an oath to defend the institutions of the nation to, after August of 1934, directly loyalty to Hitler personally. You are swearing a direct oath to Hitler the person. Not even the office of Führer or the office of Reich Chancellor, but to Hitler, okay? If you're in the German military, killing Hitler means breaking your oath, okay? So this is another very difficult question. Okay, so that's a very brief background, some of the challenges of the, the questions of resistance in the society. Let's look up here at a few of the kind of general challenges that faced um, groups of resistors. First of all, how do you organize and communicate in this kind of society? A society that tries to monitor everything you do, um, that again intervenes in all aspects of your life, public and private. How do you meet with other people and talk about overthrowing the government? It's extremely hard to do. Okay. Um, how do you communicate? Um, how do you um, write position papers and copy them and distribute them to people? Of course you don't. You'd be insane to do that. If it could be traced back to you, you'd be signing your own death sentence. All right? That's problem number one. Problem number two, just because you didn't like the Nazi regime, did not mean that you knew what you wanted to replace it with. Okay? So here's the question. You succeed in killing Hitler and replace him, but continue the government. So, in other words, I just don't like Hitler. I think Hitler's the source of the problem, and I want to get rid of him, but we're going to continue basically the rest of what we're doing. Do you change the government? If you get rid of Hitler and you say Hitler is illegitimate, is the war that he launched illegitimate, and therefore should you end the war? Or do you continue fighting the war? On whose behalf are you fighting that war? Right? So the question is not simple. If you get rid of Hitler, that sounds good, but the question is what do you replace him with? Okay? And point three is connected to this. Is Hitler the only goal? In other words, is just getting rid of Hitler enough? Um, the July 1944 plot, the bomb plot conspirators, argued that it probably wouldn't be. Not only would they have to kill Hitler, but they would have to either kill or arrest those who were immediately below him. Heinrich Himmler, for example, uh, who was the overall head of German security forces in the SS, um, who would pr likely fight to the death to defend the Nazi system. So um, does that matter? Can you just get rid of Hitler and succeed? All right. Number four. What about the impact of resistance actions on German military forces fighting in the field? <laughs> Think about this. The bomb plot of July 1944, which I'll talk about, happens as Germany is collapsing on all fronts. You've got millions of German soldiers in the field fighting against the Russians in the east and against the British and the Americans and the French and the Canadians in the west. So you've got millions of soldiers in the field fighting for Germany, 
and now you're proposing getting rid of its leadership. What impact does that have? Five, what is the impact of resistance action on your own family members and your friends? Um, the regime made it very clear in certain situations that the, the role of one individual could lead to the punishment or even the death of other family members or others that were close to you. So even though you may want to see Hitler gone and you may risk your own life to get rid of him, are you willing to risk the lives of the rest of your family to do so? Your children. Okay. And then there's the question of personal morality. One of the interesting things we see with some members of the uh, resistance movement within the intelligence services and um, the religious resistance to Hitler or those who were motivated by uh, or were outraged because of their Christian beliefs were confronted with a difficult problem which was as much as I hate Hitler, is it moral, is it correct for me to solve the problem by murdering someone, by killing someone, even if he's a terrible person? All right? So there is a dilemma that's posed in that equation as well. Yeah. Well, why then Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a minister and he should be against murder? Why did he plot to kill Hitler then? That's a very interesting question. If we have time, I'm going to get to that. You're asking a very good question. And in fact, those who, were, those who were motivated, those who were actually literally part of Germany's uh, predominantly Lutheran or Catholic uh, communities, uh, or those who were deeply devout in their religious beliefs, were faced by that exact question. One of the big things that divided some of the internal resistance movement was the question of political murder. Okay, okay so those are some of the general questions. So. How can, how can we get at this? Is there, a, is there a useful way of trying to make sense of what constitutes resistance and how we can understand it? And what I would argue is there is, and it's provided for us by a brilliant uh, young German historian who unfortunately died um, a number of years ago, uh, far too early, but he wrote uh, a great book. His name is Detlef Poikert. And he wrote a book that I've listed up here. It's called Inside Nazi Germany, Conformity, Opposition, and Racism in Everyday Life. And what he proposes is a four-part division to define what constituted resistance in Nazi Germany. The first and lowest level category is what he called nonconformist behavior. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all sorts of things fall within that category. Connected to nonconformist non behavior is refusal. One of the things I mentioned earlier was uh, the idea of parents refusing to send their son or daughter to join um, a Nazi youth organization, for example. Okay? Moving up the scale to a more robust uh, and potentially dangerous, even life-threatening, um, not to say that the first two were not life-threatening because they were, uh, but level C, he terms protest. And typically the category of protest referred to protest over single individual issues. In other words, individuals or groups that wanted to protest something that the regime had done, but were not advocating for a total removal of the leadership of the Nazi state. In other words, stopping short of completely removing Hitler and those uh, that led uh, various aspects of Nazi Germany. And that takes us then to the last, the most direct, the most risky, uh, and the most difficult. And that is the category that Poikert uh, gives us of resistance. And that is the one that we probably most normally think of when we think of resistance. People plotting together, and in many cases using violence, um, if, the, if that is the only, uh, the last resort that you have, in this case, to try to get rid of Hitler. Um, let's put it this way, in terms of our public perception of this, they don't make movies about nonconformist behavior. They're not very good. Uh, those of you that have seen Valkyrie, uh, the most recent uh, 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 kind of big budget American attempt to deal with the July 1944 bomb plot with Tom, Tom Cruise and others, that is compelling. It is a compelling story because of uh, the nature of the story and the way it developed. Uh, not to say that movie exactly records everything correctly, but it does a pretty good job. Um, but again, these are the kind of headlines that we're used to with resistance. Uh, 
Nonconformity is really interesting. It raises very interesting questions. It just doesn't get the attention probably that it should. So Poikert's scale, if you will, uh, I think is a useful way of getting at these levels or gradations of resistance. Okay. Um, so I argue here, and again, this is the point I made before and too, that there are all kinds of examples, and I'm only going to get at a few of these. We don't have anywhere near enough time for me to give you a thorough discussion of every resistance movement or nonconformist act in Nazi Germany. We'd be here until whenever, and you'd be bored, and we wouldn't want to do it anymore. So I'm going to try to survey various uh, examples, give you some examples of these different types, and, and, and maybe think a bit about what they mean, OK? Uh, rather than just focusing on the extreme end of the spectrum, that is to say opening, uh, open resistance. Okay? Um, it's important always to remember also what I talked about in the first part of the lecture. What kind of society are these groups functioning in? Uh, a society that tried to control nearly all aspects of your behavior and politicized your behavior too. Were you uh, part of the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community? Did your actions suggest that you were trustworthy, that you could be uh, considered part of that community? And that plays a role in all of this as well. Okay? And then the last question before we get to these categories. Can a seemingly insignificant act, okay? After 1934, Hitler and the Nazi leadership required, legally, that you use the Hitler salute in all public exchanges. So if you were a public employee at any level, um, you were expected, uh, especially if you were greeted with the Hitler salute, the right arm up in the air, that you would return that salute. Okay? Or in your correspondence, instead of saying sincerely, you would sign it Heil Hitler. That was a common expectation. So you look at that and you think, well, surely if I sign sincerely or I don't, salute, that doesn't mean anything. It does mean something in a society that demands your obedience to those norms, to those types of behavior. Okay? And that's part of what Poikert's getting at with these categories. All right? So let's look first at what Poikert calls nonconformist behavior uh, and or refusal. Okay? What's interesting about these um, cases, and there are thousands of them, um, and if you're interested, uh, there's a German historian has put together, and I think it's been I think it's been translated into English. You know, you think when you're studying a regime that was so destructive and so um, so casual with its with its destruction of human life, um, a, a history of humor in Nazi Germany would not be. Uh, necessarily appropriate, but the jokes that were told about the Nazi regime reveal a lot about how the German public viewed them. There are all kinds of them. Um, many of the actual Nazi leaders themselves did not exactly conform to the racial ideals that they were trying to promote in their society, uh, and that made them the subject of uh, jokes. Telling jokes and being heard by the wrong person in Nazi Germany could lead to your imprisonment or potentially if it were combined with other types of nonconformist behavior, you could be tortured or killed. So humor in a highly politicized society like Nazi Germany meant something. Okay? Um, it didn't always rise to the level of major secret police or security intervention. So one of the reasons that we don't hear as much about nonconformist behavior or refusal is because um, the, the Gestapo and other forces of the secret police aren't tracking down every single person that tells a joke about Hermann Goering. Okay? Um, likewise, they're not tracking down every single person that refuses to give the Nazi salute, the Heil Hitler salute. Okay? Um, in certain cases they did, and in certain cases uh, very serious punishment, even death, followed. But it didn't happen in every case. And so this is the lowest level of uh, refusing to go along with some aspects of the regime. Okay? Um, and I mentioned some of these already. Refusing to give the Hitler greeting. Uh, telling jokes that were critical of the regime. Complaining about various aspects of Nazi society at home. 
or less so often in public, or as I mentioned before, refusing to send a son or a daughter to join a Nazi youth organization. Yeah. Well, is that why Hitler persecuted Jehovah's Witness? Because they didn't believe in saluting the flag and pledging allegiance to the uh, German regime? Because they don't even do that here. No. Um, Jehovah's Witness is an interesting category, uh, but the primary, regime, the primary reason that Jehovah's Witness were persecuted is because they were deemed to be one of the groups that stood outside of the Volksgemeinschaft, primarily because of their religious beliefs and also because, as you mentioned, their attitudes uh, of loyalty toward government in that sense. Um, so Nazi Germany had a large category, uh, and as they developed increasingly strong measures against their Jewish population, they also began to focus on other groups as well. And there was a category that German security services used, which in English we would use the word asocial. Uh, asocial uh, were groups of individuals in German society that did not, that refused to conform. This is not the occasional failure to salute or the occasional failure to sign uh, Hitler's name or whatever it is. These are groups that consciously refuse to go along with basic principles of German society. And usually, according to the kind of very flawed racial thinking of the Nazi regime, usually that had something to do with a defect in their personality or their racial composition. And so um, in persecuting individual religious groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, these are individuals who chose to stand outside of the people's community and uh, by willingly choosing to do that, they were putting themselves at risk. That was the Nazi view of that, okay? All right, so we have a really interesting picture here. Now, whether or not this is a guy named August Landmeser or not, we don't know for sure, okay? There's a little bit of controversy about this picture. His daughter is 100% convinced that that's her father, okay? This picture was taken in 1936 at one of Germany's uh, biggest shipbuilding lots, Blomen Voss, um, and they were launching uh, a ship. This was a formal uh, official event. There were lots of Nazi party officials there, and all of the shipyard workers plus others were there at the launching of this ship, and uh, at the appropriate time, they were encouraged to give the Hitler salute. Um, and this picture has gained some notoriety. It was published first in Germany. Someone found it, and it's kind of gone around. In fact, it has a little bit of kind of meme status online, uh, if any of you have seen this in other uh, situations. And here's a guy surrounded completely by people, whether they truly deep down supported the Nazis or not, it had become common to use the Hitler salute. And here's a guy with his arms crossed in front of him, absolutely, without question, this is not an accident, He's not looking at his phone, he's not, you know, he is clearly looking forward and he is clearly choosing not to use the salute. And there's a long backstory to this. August Landmeser was an interesting uh, guy. He actually had joined the Nazi party in the early 1930s, uh, but then fell in love with a Jewish woman and tried to marry her in the late, late in the year in 1935 in Hamburg, in the Hamburg District Court, which is where he lived. The problem is the Nazi regime had just passed a whole series of laws called the Nuremberg Laws, which some of you have, uh, I, I would guess, heard, heard from or heard about. And these were laws that were intended to protect the purity of the German race. They were intended to prevent Jews and non-Jews from first intermarrying or having any kind of sexual relationship of any kind. And so Lodmeister here, uh, his wife was, or uh, his fiance, uh, he was not able to get married. She was pregnant with their first daughter. And the German court refused to marry them on a racial basis because he was a quote-unquote Aryan German and she was uh, a, a Jewish, uh, wouldn't even call her a Jewish German any longer. Um, and so they refused to marry them. Uh, this soured his view of the Nazi regime. His daughter argues this was him uh, in this picture. There's, uh, there are some, some others who argue that it was someone else, but, but um, there's some uh, debate about this. But the point is, if you look at this picture, you think, does that matter? Um, and again, this goes to the question, uh, why study resistance? Is it important that we have a guy in a crowd uh, of hands that are up like this with his arms clearly crossed, defying uh, these social conventions? Does that matter?
it becomes really interesting when you know more about his background. And his background was actually tragic. Uh, he and his wife tried to escape. He tried to escape to Denmark. They were captured. He was in prison. Uh, she was sent to a, a, a transit camp where her second daughter was born eventually, and then she was sent to uh, one of the secret euthanasia centers or, or centers where, where people were being killed, uh, and she eventually died. Uh, he was taken into the German, uh, basically, Auxiliary Service Corps in 1944 and was listed as uh, missing in action, presumed killed. Uh, and so their daughters ended up uh, in foster care. So he was not punished only because he refused to give the Hitler salute, but it does raise some interesting questions. And if you know his own life and his own background, um, it, it raises questions about what it means not to go along in this kind of society. What about protest? Protest is an interesting and somewhat controversial category. Uh, here, Poikert, the German historian I mentioned earlier, is talking about a category that often included what we call single-issue protest. Okay? In other words, you could have issues with a particular decision that the Nazi regime took and protest that vigorously while at the same time not arguing for the complete overthrow of the regime. Okay? So, what are some examples of that and why are those important? Okay? Example A. Spring of 1941. Germany has been at war for um, the better part of two years. Uh, German troops are fighting uh, at the time in the field, especially in Yugoslavia and southeastern Europe. And it's only months before Nazi Germany launches the massive invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, known as Operation Barbarossa. Right? In various parts of the southern German state of Bavaria, most of that particular part of Germany was fairly heavily Catholic, a local Nazi official, a Gauleiter, uh, took some initiative on its own. He was not seeing enough Nazi-themed education in many of the local uh, parochial ca classrooms. And so a way, in a way, uh, to try to encourage more enthusiasm for Nazi themes, Nazi songs, Nazi images, um, he called for the removal of crucifixes from classrooms uh, in his district in Bavaria, okay, to be replaced with uh, Nazi propaganda, posters, and so forth. This was met with a massive outpouring of parental uh, complaint, fury, writing into the local uh, Nazi office, writing uh, to various uh, 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 levels of the church uh, hierarchy, writing to directly to Berlin, to the leadership of Nazi Germany. Um, why are you doing this? So here's what's interesting. You're in the middle of the war. You have troops in the field fighting. And you say, well, it's a totalitarian society. We can do whatever we want. Round up every one of those parents and their kids, and we'll ship them off and kill them. In fact, that's not what happened. What happened was that within two weeks of this decision, the outpouring was so significant that Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister, ordered the local Nazi official and said, put the crucifixes back up in the classrooms. We'll deal with it later. Okay? So it works. Here you have a case of public protest against a measure taken by a Nazi official, and the Nazi party reverses its course, and it reverses its decision. Well, why does it do that? A number of reasons. It's in the middle of a war, it's deeply concerned about the opinion and the loyalty of Germany's Catholic population, especially in Bavaria. Right? It does not want to be perceived as being anti-Christian. Many of the troops in the field drew strength from their Christian beliefs, and the Nazi regime was deeply critical of the other big world power at the time, communism, for being 
anti-Christian and trying to destroy Christian beliefs. So for all of these different reasons, the Nazi state backs off and says, put the crucifixes back in. By all measure, if they had won the war, it's likely they would have ripped the crucifixes off the wall and there would have been nothing more said of it. But while the war was still being fought, while it was still in question, uh, the Nazi regime felt they had to back off. Likewise, Catholic Bishop Clemens von Gallen of Munster, let's see if I can get his picture to come up here. Oh, doesn't seem to want to. Um, preached a series of sermons in July and August of 1941 condemning Nazi con uh, confiscation of church property and the regime's ongoing T4 euthanasia program. July, August of 1941. The Nazis have just launched the invasion of the Soviet Union. Okay? And here from the pulpit, you have a very locally well-respected Catholic bishop condemning the Nazi regime openly in uh, mass in, uh, in a series of uh, dates late July into early August. Okay? He's condemning Nazi attempts to confiscate church buildings, and he especially takes issue with the Nazis' euthanasia program, a program that was uh, in the middle of killing uh, tens of thousands of German citizens who were handicapped or mentally and physically disabled. Okay? And it was doing so uh, secretly under the guise of um, uh, uh, medical treatments. Okay? And that became more widely known and Clemens von Gallen, along with a number of other major um, uh, leaders in the Catholic Church, spoke out against this. Okay? Now, again, you would think, well, that's, um, that's going to be it. He will be arrested, he'll be uh, imprisoned, put in a concentration camp, or executed. He was not. There were some in the Nazi hierarchy that wanted to see that happen. Again, Hitler and Josef Goebbels, who was in charge of propaganda, said, we cannot move publicly against this guy. He's too well known. He's too prominent. Uh, and so as a result of this, this euthanasia program, the T4 program as it was known, was at least publicly, formally canceled. Uh, it continued official, it, it continued unofficially all the way until the end of the war, secretly. Uh, but the regime responded uh, to his and the protest of other um, uh, priests and leaders of the Catholic Church who were condemning this um, loss of life in Germany um, that was going on with the T4 program. Okay? Another example, and the last one that I'm going to talk about here. This is a fascinating one. This was a protest smack dab in the middle of downtown Berlin, middle of the war. February through March of 1943, Germ uh, Berlin is starting to fall under major Allied bombardment. Uh, uh, Allied British and American Air Forces are starting more frequently to bomb Berlin. And there is a major protest that takes place in February, March of 1943. What is this protest about? It centers on the question of intermarriage in Nazi Germany, which is a fast another fascinating topic. We don't have time to go into all of that tonight. In other words, one of the things that the Nazis tried to do is create a pure Aryan society, get rid of Jews, get rid of anything that would undermine that society. Well, what happened to all of the people who had married Jews and non-Jews who had already married before the Nazis came to power, right? Who had had children and so forth. So this question of intermarriage, the Nazis were never able to fully resolve. And there were over 30,000 of these Jewish and non-Jewish intermarriages uh, in Germany, right? And there was an extremely high rate of survival for the Jewish spouse in those intermarried relationships. Why? Again, because the Nazi regime was afraid to take action where there might be significant public protest. So the non-Jewish spouse might raise issues publicly. Um, they might try to band together to try to do something. And that is exactly what happens with these Rosenstrasse protests uh, in February, March of 1943. Overwhelmingly, uh, their spouses came out. They were being held for deportation. Uh, many of them were women. Their husbands were being held for deportation uh, to uh, extermination camps. 
And what was the result of this protest? The SS shows up, it tries to discourage uh, the women uh, from doing this, turn them back to their houses, say forget about your husband. Uh, they refuse to do so, and as a result of this protest, a very high percentage of their Jewish spouses actually ended up surviving the war. And the regime backs off again. So again, you think in a totalitarian society, surely they can do whatever they want. There are plenty of examples of what we call single issue protest. Now, did these non-Jewish spouses then say, not only am I gonna save my husband or my wife, but I'm gonna march over to the Reich Chancellery and I'm gonna assassinate Adolf Hitler. No, they just wanted to get their spouse back and not have their spouse killed. That did not mean they wanted to overthrow the regime, but in the case of these single issue protests, oftentimes they worked. Well, why did they work? And these are the last points here. First of all, timing was crucial. Germany is in a war. Hitler was obsessed with the idea of public morale. Hitler had fought in the First World War himself, and he was convinced that one of the main reasons that Germany lost the First World War was not because of its soldiers, but because it had lost the will to continue fighting the war on the home front. Uh, and so Hitler very strongly pushed for the idea that in certain situations like this, that you give them what they want for now. If the war was won and it was over with, it probably would have been dealt with then. But for now, give them what they want to prevent uh, a much larger protest from taking place, okay? There was a great deal of concern about public uh, morale and support for the regime. Second reason, these are single issue protests, as I said before. They were not trying to end the Nazi regime or kill Hitler or overthrow him. They were simply trying to deal with one particular issue. Um, Primo Levi, who was, uh, 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 in, involved uh, directly in the Holocaust, a victim of the Holocaust, used the phrase usism to describe this process. So individuals who may protest or may push back until they reach the limits where the benefits of what they're doing extend beyond themselves. Um, and this is a, a, an issue that he noted in the camps. It's an issue that applies here as well. These are people who are pushing the boundaries only so far to deal with the issue that affects them personally and directly, okay? Uh, another factor is the prominence or the social position of the protesters. In the case of Clemens von Gallen, this was not somebody, uh, many of his parishioners and those who worshiped with him on a regular basis, this is not a guy that you could break into his house, drag him out and shoot him. He had too high a public profile um, in that sense. And so uh, this became uh, an issue in some cases as well. And then there's the last and really fascinating phenomenon of the single issue protesters. And the British historian Ian Kershaw has written about this in a number of his books. What is amazing about some of these single issue protesters is this. It's what Kershaw calls the if only the Fuhrer knew or if only Hitler knew, okay? And the way this works is many of these uh, people who were upset about the crucifix issue or about their um, spouse or other issues that I haven't had time to mention, they would write letters directly to Hitler. <laughs> and they would say, uh, hey, do you realize that this clown that you've got running things down in Bavaria has removed the crucifixes from our classrooms? Right? And they would say, get, you know, I need your help. Fire this guy or get rid of him and get somebody in there who understands what we really need to happen. And what's amazing about this is you could have this belief in the power and the authority of Hitler, but you could criticize certain aspects of what his regime did. And Kershaw said this was the, one of the important pieces that held Nazi control together for so long. Many Germans said, you know what, I'll bet this is just a local corrupt individual doing this. And if the Fuhrer knew about this, he would clean house and immediately would get rid of these people and would run things the right way. And this becomes a strange safety net. It becomes a way for people to still believe in the regime and still believe in Hitler while criticizing individual behavior of, of, of Nazi officials at the local and the regional level. It's a kind of safety valve. And uh, Ian Kershaw uh, calls this the if only the Fuhrer knew phenomenon. In other words, if Hitler knew about this, this stuff wouldn't be going on. 
Let's turn then to the last category, uh, which is the category of resistance, the one that we're most uh, probably familiar with um, and is probably the most compelling. Uh, Kershaw defines, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Detlef Poikert defines resistance as extreme action intended to undermine, destabilize, or actually overthrow Hitler and the Nazi regime. Right? Almost always resistance was broader than a single issue protest. In other words, these were not people who just wanted crucifixes removed or just wanted to defend their non uh, or their Jewish spouse, for example. Uh, but they were born out of a deep conviction that Hitler's government was deeply flawed, morally compromised, and in many cases that it was criminal, okay? That it was illegitimate and needed to be removed. The critical question of motivation and what resistors planned to create in place of Hitler if they ever succeeded was the important thing here. So what are some examples uh, of this particular movement? The first, uh, and one that was not immediately as well known after the war, but we've come to know a lot more about uh, over the past uh, decades, is what's called the White Rose Movement. Uh, the White Rose Movement was made up of university students, a brother and sister, um, Hans and Sophie Scholl were the, main, uh, were the main driving force behind this. They were both students at the University uh, of Munich. And they began to distribute pamphlets condemning the Nazi regime and its genocidal policies. Hans Scholl was a medical student at uh, the University of Munich. And those medical students, in the course of their studies, were transferred for a period of several months to the front lines where German forces were fighting. So Hans Scholl spent months at, uh, on the Russian front with German troops and came in contact with some of the um, hideous and barbaric practices that were connected to the Holocaust uh, and the extermination of uh, the Jewish population in the East. And when he returned, came to the conclusion that he could no longer support uh, that regime. His sister assisted him with this, uh, along with Christoph Probst, a good friend of theirs, and several others. And they started to distribute pamphlets uh, accusing uh, the Nazi regime of being an illegitimate and criminal regime. It spread to other major German cities. And unfortunately, in February of 1943, uh, they were caught distributing leaflets, strangely enough, by a janitor uh, at uh, the University of Munich uh, as Sophie Scholl was throwing the last of a series of pamphlets over the upper railing into the foyer of the main university building. He saw her doing this. They were brought before uh, a Nazi court uh, and found guilty of treason to the state, and they were executed. Incidentally, one of the, um, the common forms of execution uh, in the Nazi state was still the use of the guillotine. And that's, in fact, how the White Rose conspirators, as the Nazi state viewed them, were killed. The last example that I want to give today, and there are other examples of this that I could mention, but the last example I want to give is the one that I mentioned at the beginning, and it takes us back to the plaque uh, that I talked to you about. And this is the July 20th, 1944 bomb plot. This is probably the best known example of an outright attempt to assassinate Hitler uh, and implement what was called the Operation Valkyrie plan. This is a plan that once Hitler had been killed, uh, you would mobilize uh, the sort of central German forces in Berlin and you would replace the Nazi government with a government that was in many ways yet to be determined. But the idea was to use uh, a bomb that was packed in a, uh, uh, basically a suitcase or a bag, a meeting bag like this. Uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg was the officer who uh, volunteered and was tasked with placing the bomb under Hitler's conference table at his uh, Eastern Prussian headquarters. The bomb was placed under the table but unfortunately, for those of you who know the story, uh, the bag itself was moved at the last minute from a position that had it been left there, it probably would have succeeded in killing Hitler. It was moved to the side of a heavy table leg, and so the blast when the bomb went off was deflected away in such a way that it, while it injured Hitler, it failed uh, to uh, mortally wound him uh, and kill him, so Hitler survived. Stauffenberg and many of his other conspirators, many of whom were in the German army or were in German intelligence services, were quickly discovered uh, without trial. Many of them were shot immediately, Stauffenberg and the other conspirators, but then began a terrible act of retribution on Hitler's part. 
where anyone who was in any way connected with these conspirators was rounded up, put in prison, and some of them who were directly connected with this um, were killed by being hung uh, by piano wire, a particularly gruesome death, which was filmed uh, for Hitler to watch later on. Uh, so you have here probably the most um, sensational and the most well-known example of resistance, uh, probably the White Rose Movement and Stauffenberg, the 20th of July, 1944 bomb plot. So again, um, why do these matter? As I said at the beginning, they, they failed to kill Hitler. There were multiple other bomb plots and attempts to kill Hitler while he was in an airplane, while he was speaking at a restaurant. There's a whole series of other ones that I haven't mentioned here. Um, why does it matter? Well, that's the very last panel, the very last thing that I want to talk about tonight. Um, and that's the question of public support and then how the resistance was viewed after the war was over with. So here's the question. Why didn't more people back these people who took such a risk to resist the Nazi state? And one of the best known uh, historians of the German resistance, Peter Hoffman, answers it this way. Number one, the majority of the German population, especially by the outbreak of World War II, had come to view Hitler's government as duly constituted and legal. In other words, by the time World War II breaks out, most of the people who refused to acknowledge Hitler's government as legitimate had either been killed or forced into exile. Right? So the remaining large majority of the German population was going along with what Hitler and the Nazis were trying to do. And they regarded that government as being legitimate. So for many average Germans, they're saying, what you're trying to do is overthrow a legitimate government. Could be construed or understood to be treason. Okay? Um, any broad popular support for the resistance would have implied action against an entire political system. Just killing Hitler probably would not have been enough. It would have meant to support to overthrow the entire system itself. Okay? Second, Hoffman argues that the unexpected success of Hitler's government on the home front, so one of the very popular measures that Hitler's government achieved in the 1930s was dealing, quote-unquote, quote solving the unemployment problem, or in foreign policy in gaining back territories uh, that had been, as many saw it, robbed of Germany during the war at the end of World War I, um, or on the battlefield. So, in other words, as long as Hitler's doing well, he's popular. He's very popular. Most of the public is willing to go along with uh, even some of his most controversial measures. You're winning the war. It looks like Germany's undefeatable. After the Battle of Stalingrad at the end of 1942 and the beginning of 1943, in February of 1943, when the German leadership has to come out on the radio and admit that the German Sixth Army has been defeated at the Battle of Stalingrad, a turning point in the war, you begin to see resistance activity gradually start to increase and also public willingness to consider, at least think about, um, the value of resistance to the Nazi regime increase as well. So when the tide of war shifts against Germany, especially after Stalingrad, you see uh, interest in resistance go up. Last, there is widespread perception that the Nazi police state and its instruments, that is to say the Gestapo and other forces, were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. And they knew everything about everyone's lives. And so this placed the cost of supporting or participating in any form of active resistance at a very high level. In other words, you potentially were risking your own life or the life of your family to go against the regime in this scenario. And so the cost-benefit analysis um, was a very difficult one for many average Germans to make. The idea was there's no point in trying. Even if I try to participate in this, they'll figure it out and I'll be dead before I can do anything. This was one of the disincentives to participating in resistance. And these are the three major ideas that Hoffman promotes. Okay? Last today, and then um, I'll take some questions. What did the resistance, German resistance, look like after the war? So this is one of the really interesting questions. We would sit here today, as I said at the beginning of the talk, and say, these were heroes. 
That plaque that you saw uh, at the Memorial Center for the German Resistance commemorates Stauffenberg and these other guys as heroes for trying to kill Hitler. Well, how did the German people feel about that? <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, that was not a, a very clear belief after the war. Okay? So what do we know about post-World War II Germany? We know that Germany was uh, comprehensively destroyed. Uh, most major German cities were either completely or partially wiped out, either as a result of Allied bombing or um, the vicious fighting that took place in parts of Germany at the end of the war. The country was split up into Allied zones of occupation. It was divided between the Soviet Union, the United States, Great Britain, and France. And eventually those four zones became what would become known after 1949 West and East Germany, Communist East Germany and Democratic West Germany. Okay? Um, and what's interesting is when you look at scholarship and public commemoration of the resistance, it matters a whole lot which Germany you're in. Okay? It matters a lot. Right? As the battle lines became drawn in the Cold War, both of these countries tended to promote and emphasize resistance heroes that conformed to their general ideological viewpoint. This was especially true in communist East Germany, where the resistance to Hitler was basically almost completely understood as the anti-fascist resistance. And what this meant was the resistance that existed in Germany on the political left, communist uh, and social democrat uh, groups, while ignoring most of the other conservative and, generally speaking, uh, Christian sources of resistance uh, that was highlighted in West Germany. Okay? What is really interesting, though, is point C. In the first decades after the war, Stauffenberg and many of his co-conspirators were viewed by significant parts of the West German public as traitors. There is a poll that was taken in 1952, and it asked the German public, how do you view the members of the July 1944 bomb plot. And they are about equally split uh, as being patriotic Germans or being traitors to the fatherland. It's equally split. There was significant public protest in early attempts to try to name streets after Stauffenberg and others. Um, and you say, why is this? Those Germans who held them as traitors argued, my husband or my son was fighting against the Russians or the Americans or the British, um, and while they're giving their lives for Germany, Stauffenberg and these guys are trying to destabilize our country and undermine our country from within. Okay? This is why the issue of resistance is not um, as clear-cut as we think that it is. Um, it's surprising. In a very similar poll in the early 1950s, incidentally, in West Germany, the German people were asked, who was the greatest... Uh, leader in German history. And one of the options of that poll was Adolf Hitler before 1938, up to 1938. In other words, before the war started. Bismarck and others were in this poll. Um, Hitler finished first in that poll, pre-1939. Okay? So, uh, just because the war ends does not mean that those opinions necessarily go away. And those who resisted the regime um, for many, they argued, hey, you swore an oath directly to Hitler for those who were in the military or the civil service, and you broke that oath. You were a traitor uh, to Germany. And so that was a very controversial position. It's interesting, from the 1960s on, the image of Stauffenberg and other resistance groups begin to change. One of the catalysts for that change are the protests uh, in the 1960s in Germany, especially the year 1968, where you see huge levels of student protests. Um, you see the same in the United States uh, in relation to the Vietnam War and civil rights. There were also a whole series of issues in major European countries like Germany and France uh, in the year 1968. And as you begin to see much more public protest um, in the 1960s in Germany, gradually those who were involved in the resistance become drawn into that. Uh, and what you see is that it becomes more publicly acceptable uh, to, to view them as heroes who stood up for an alternative vision of Germany rather than traitors 
who tried to destroy the German leadership in a time of war. So as a result of that, if you go to many German cities today, and this is especially true in Germany, you can find German streets named after a wide range of those who attempted to resist the Nazi regime. Had you gone there in the 1950s, you would not have found those same street names. So there's an interesting history uh, to the way in which uh, the post-war attitudes towards the resistance developed. And that takes us back, and this is the last thing I want to say to that image at the beginning. A clear-cut idea about heroes who resisted and fought uh, and were not tainted by the, the regime. Uh, and what we find when we look at the resistance and we look at the questions that surround the resistance, while that plaque commemorates a particular version of the resistance and one with which most of us today, I hope, agree, uh, that was not always the case. And I hope that my discussion tonight at least tried to bring some of those differences into a bit more perspective. Thanks. Thank you.